Welcome to the Conversations That Matter podcast. I'm your host, John Harris. We have a unique opportunity to navigate a tricky but important topic today with two esteemed guests. Our goal is to help you answer the question, when do we become culpable and therefore in need of confession and repentance for our sinful desires? Is it at the point of temptation? Is it when we internally entertain our temptation or when this sin is manifested and we are overcome by an external act of sin? Currently, the surrounding world is running blindly toward the view that sexual preferences do not intrinsically possess a moral component. Advocates of side B revoice theology maintain that Christians do not experience homosexual desires as a result of sin and should include their attractions as part of their identity. Both of today's guests oppose these positions, but there is disagreement over whether being tempted by inner temptation or, or um, inner sinful desires is a sin to be confessed. Can the position that it's not a sin to be confessed serve as an initial step to rationalize revoice, or is it simply what the Bible teaches? In the spirit of healthy Christian discussion as iron sharpens iron, I'd like to welcome pastors Doug Wilson and Jared Moore. And uh, thank you guys, both of you. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you for um, letting me participate. Well, for those who don't know, I think a lot of people probably do, but Doug Wilson, um, Pastor Doug Wilson serves as the pastor of Christ Church in Moscow, Idaho, and he's a faculty member at New St. Andrews College, author and speaker, and uh, I believe you're the founder of Canon Press as well. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. And uh, Pastor Jared Moore uh, is the author of The Pulp Culture Parent. He's written for Founders and Monergism on the topic we're going to discuss today, and he graduated from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. So I want to start off just with asking a basic question uh, for both of you. Maybe, you know, Jared, you could start and then Pastor Wilson, uh, you could um, follow up and, and then we'll start the discussion this way. But the, the question that I have for you, Jared, is, is being tempted without indulging in temptation a sin? Well, it depends on what kind of temptation it is. Um, if you're tempted with an inherently good thing, but it's offered through an evil means and you reject the evil means, then you're being tempted like Jesus. And um, then you haven't sinned. But if you're tempting yourself from within, meaning the lust of the flesh has started in your heart, an evil desire, an evil inclination, an evil motion of original sin, then you've already begun to sin in your heart. And the question is, will you, will you let it permit to go further to mature and grow and harm you even more? Or will you reject it, confess it, and seek to put your hand to something good, something obedient to the Lord? The ultimate issue concerning these question, this question is, am I being obedient to God from my heart? And so if you're eternally tempted, um, internally tempting yourself, then that, that is obviously not obedience from the heart. That is the beginning of disobedience. But when, when you're saved, Holy Spirit is producing desires within you as well. And so now your will is free due to the Holy Spirit. And so you can either submit to the flesh or submit to the spirit. And so both of those desires are being produced in you. It's just one of them is sinful, evil, culpable, but they're both from within you. And so when you resist that internal temptation, it is a victory as far as action, but it is not a victory concerning your heart. The goal is to be sinless in heart like Jesus is. So, so Pastor Wilson, how would you answer that question? And, and would your answer differ from uh, uh, Pastor Moore's about being tempted uh, without indulging in that temptation? Let me begin by saying that I don't think there's a difference between us when it comes to what should be the outcome practically in terms of action. I think the difference between us has to do with how we frame what's going on theologically. And what I'm saying is that I want to make a distinction between what I am, fallen, corrupted, busted in certain respects, what I am, and what I do. So uh, there's a point, and there's a threshold where our corruption of nature, which the Westminster Confession says is truly and properly sinful, right? It's, it's not, it's no bueno, it's no good. Um, I should be in a position to lament that 
lament that fact, long for the day of resurrection when I'm not going to be afflicted by these things anymore. But there I am acknowledging what I am. That's different from what I do. So when Peter tells us, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Okay, there's there are these fleshly lusts within that are at war with me. I've got a I've got a traitor within the ranks. <laughs> okay, so if I'm a if I'm an army wanting to do battle uh, for righteousness, I know that I've got a Judas inside. I've got a I've got a traitor in there, and that is a lamentable and sinful situation. But it's not what I'm doing, because it's possible, I believe, for us to obey what Peter says to do when he says abstain. So abstain from fleshly lust. And I think that if I don't abstain, if I if there's any kind of dalliance, or even if it's 15 seconds of man, I man, I really like to go that way, and you give way, then that's 15 seconds of sin that you should confess. But I don't think you need to confess as a particular sin the fact that this situation arose. You do need to confess that you're sinful, you're corrupt and sinful, but that's an acknowledgement of what you are, not a confession of what you did. You didn't do anything wrong. Okay, yeah, Jared, Jared any thoughts? I don't hear you guys interact on it. Uh, do you disagree with anything or are you guys in agreement on that? Um, what Wilson just described is a, um, a particular instance of emotion of original sin. I mean, he, um, Pastor Wilson, you, you say you're describing what you are fallen, but then you describe it as a particular instance of fleshly lust and then say you don't have to confess that particular instance. And so I'm... You, you don't have to confess it if you do what Peter says to do and abstain. But it's a motion of original sin. Would you would you identify it as a motion of original sin as the Westminster does? Well, I don't think we can be that particular it, of about of, about a, a specific situation because I, we're up against the world, the flesh, and the devil, all three. All right, and there are times there are times when the only one responsible for the temptation is me. <laughs> you know, the devil's leaving me alone and the world isn't doing anything and it's just me. Now, I believe that that would be a motion of uh, when original sin starts to move and make suggestions, then I think confession would be appropriate. But uh, when I'm driving down the highway, minding my own business, singing songs, and then there's a billboard with uh, some lady with not very many clothes on and it, and it hits me, that's the world. And then the devil's on my right shoulder saying, hey, look at her. OK, well, I'm not in a position to parse out how much of that was world, how much of that was devil, how much of that was the flesh. All I'm responsible for is to abstain. OK, now, when I'm when I don't have any external temptation from the world and it's, and let's say hypothetically, there's no uh, demonic or diabolical presence there. Colossians three, five says mortify your members which are on the earth all right so i've got members which are on the earth and you rightly said our duty is obedience well i believe i'm being obedient if i'm mortifying them well but they've got to be there in order to mortify and so i don't want to be uh saying that someone can be simultaneously obedient and disobedient he, he's disobedient because he's got these things to mortify and he's obedient because he's mortifying them well, which which is he is he obedient or disobedient so i think it's better to parse it out and say uh when i when i'm praying to the lord when i'm thanking god for my justification when i'm confessing sin uh, in the church service we have a time of confession uh, i think it's fully appropriate for me to confess my sinfulness you know the the, the i think it's appropriate to confess original sin but I want to confess it as original sin and not as something I'm doing, because as soon as I confess it as something I'm doing, I'm driven into a law of non-contradiction situation where I'm, I'm obedient because I'm confessing it and I'm disobedient because I'm doing it. 
well, I'm trying to occupy the same space at the same time with opposite um, actions. So if it's, if it's reducible to actions, then I can't push and pull at the same time. If it's my sinful state and condition, I can acknowledge that. And if I'm the driver, if I'm tempting myself, right? Uh, James talks about that. Every man's lured, tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Uh, when that's happening, then yeah, I should confess the stirrings of original sin. Because, but, but if, if uh, it, it appears in my thought, thought life or it appears in, in my mind, and within a second, I say no, right? You know, I, I say no, then I'm being obedient. I'm doing what Peter said to do. I'm abstaining from fleshly lusts. But the fact that I have them there, that the, the material is there, uh, is a corrupt nature, but I'm not responsible to confess them when they're in a quiescent state. Yeah, J Jared, any thoughts on that? It, it still sounds like, Pastor Wilson, you're saying you don't have to confess a motion of original sin. You're, we're talking about inclinations. We're talking about fleshly lusts. You would say you don't have to confess fleshly lusts? Well, I don't have to confess fleshly lusts um, that are uh, not active. But they are active if they are pricking your heart. It's an inclination. It's a motion. It's not. My thing is, if you can name it, it's active. Like original sin as a state of corruption, it's not particular. You you don't know the that you couldn't name the sin. But well, we're talking about. That. Go ahead. Yeah, but what I what I don't know this is this uh, is drilling down even deeper into my lack of knowledge of how much of this is the devil, how much of this is the world, and how much of this is me, right? And then I've got to drill down further and say, of the part that's me, how much of it is simply biological desire that's creational and God-given, you know, just uh, uh, a state of wanting to have sexual release somehow, some way. That's just part of our creational nature. That's a biological thing. Right. And but then there is the fleshly lust that wants to transgress the law of God, that, that wants it because it's forbidden. There's something there's something twisted and bent in it. OK, now I don't have the luxury of parsing out how much of it of it was culpable from me because I, can't, I have no way of telling. So when Jesus was tempted. It was not like uh, if someone offered me a bowl of cockroaches, here, eat a bowl of cockroaches. Um, I'm not going to be tempted, <laughs> right? There's nothing in me that, re that uh, resonates to that. They're, the devil's pitching his temptation poorly at that, at that point. But if uh, he offers, offers me a bowl of ice cream, and I've had, already had two bowls of ice cream, if he's pitching something, to me and there's something in me that says well maybe i could go for that there is a place where my sensation of wanting to do something that violates the law of god maps onto what jesus went through when jesus was tempted to turn stones into bread he was hungry that temptation came to him at that point in time for a reason OK, now the fact that Jesus was hungry and a suggestion was made to satisfy that hunger in a way that transgressed the law of God, the fact that there's a tug doesn't mean you're in sin. Because if there's a, any kind of if there's no tug at all, there's no temptation. And Jesus doesn't know what it's like to be a high priest, contrary to Hebrews. But if there's a tug, then that doesn't necessitate sin because Jesus never sinned. So is there any area where there's a tug or an allure for a sin, sinful person like me to do something that would violate the law of God? It's enough of a tug that I recognize it and realize it. And in that moment, say, no, can I walk away without confessing 
a particular sin and a, a, a sin that I committed. Now, I also recognize that some of the tug has its force for me in ways that it didn't have for Jesus because Jesus never had antecedent sin or experience with sin at all. So in some ways, the tug is worse for me, but in other ways, the tug was worse for Christ because he's the one, you know, we're all standing at hundred mile hour winds and Jesus is the one not blowing over. And that means he knows more about the wind than we do. Jesus knows more about temptation than we do because sin doesn't qualify me to understand, but it does, it, it opens me up in some ways. And I think that there are times when that happens and I can walk away, lament my corrupt nature, lament the fact that I'm in a world where this sort of thing happens to me and thank God for the imputation of Christ's righteousness and thank God for the deliverance from, I didn't go look at that porn site or I didn't, I didn't go do whatever it was. So there, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, in talking about Jesus's temptation, do you believe that he desired to disobey God? No, he desired to not. Okay. So when you say he was tugged toward the devil's offerings, what do you mean? So um, John tells us um, to love not the world or the things in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I think that that maps onto the temptation in the garden. Lust of the eyes. Eve saw that the fruit was good to look at. It was lust of the flesh. It was good to eat. Pride of life, able to make one wise. So I think worldliness was the temptation that Eve fell to um, at, at that moment. And there's a mystery in temptation. If, if, all, if all Christ's temptations were just technically temptations, but all the devil was doing was offering him bowls of cockroaches, right? Where there was absolutely nothing in him that wanted to have anything to do with it. Then it's hard to see how we have a high priest who knows what it's like to go through what we're going through. There, there has to be some element where Christ felt the pressure. And we know, we know that he felt the pressure. Uh, it says in Luke, I think it's in Luke, when the devil left him after the temptation, it says he, he left him for a season. He left, left him for a time. So I don't think Jesus was tempted at the beginning of his ministry, and then it was all plain sailing after that. I think he was tempted later. And we knew, I, I would surmise that one of the great temptations was in Gethsemane, right? It, we have a, the Father's yeah. will and his own will, and he subordinates his own will to the Father's will. And he says to his disciples that he is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. He felt it, right? Now, what I'm saying is that to feel the pressure while you're in a battle, resisting that pressure is not a sin. Okay, that's what I'm maintaining. Uh, as soon as I give way, as soon as I tell the devil, man, you've got a point there, and maybe I can just dally with this a little bit longer. Maybe I can prolong the battle so I can enjoy the temptation. There's all sorts of rationalizations that, yeah, I should, I should confess my sin as soon as I catch myself doing any of that stuff. But I don't think I need to confess being in the battle itself. I don't think I need to confess feeling the force of it because Jesus felt the force of it. But Jesus, so in, in the blog article that you wrote in response to me, you mention a fellow who is having same-sex attraction and he's on a computer and he, a pop-up pops up and it is of uh, homosexual pornography. Right. And his heart says it's good to him, but then he resists it. Right. And so that, that example, that doesn't sound like, are you, are you comparing that example to Jesus's, um, experience in the garden of Gethsemane as far as feeling the force of it? No, I think they're not exactly comparable because I, as I also noted in the article, there are certain sins that have prerequisites. Um, Jesus was never, uh, uh, you know, tempted to shoot somebody for drug money. Um, 
this, there, are, there are certain sins that you can't get to without a long trail of antecedent sin. And homosexual temptation is, Paul describes in Romans 1 as sort of the end of the road, right? So I don't believe that Jesus was ever tempted to molest little boys or was ever tempted in a homosexual way. But I do think that all the common human temptations of preserving his life, um, vindicating himself in the, you know, if you throw yourself down from the temple uh, to bypass the cross, all, there are a number of temptations that you might describe as standard issue human temptations. Christ felt the force of it. So the, the comparison with the guy, the, the guy with same-sex temptations and the pop-up ad and Christ temptations, there's, they're, they're only comparable in this one sense. That Christian resisting same-sex temptation can draw solace and strength from the fact that Jesus knows what it's like to say no to a sin, even if it costs you. Jesus knows what it's like to feel pressure, not pressure of the sort that I'm feeling, but pressure to do wrong. Now, there's one other thing, and this is important to acknowledge. That I, I think this is the point you could make. There's a difference between someone who is tempted to have a third bowl of ice cream, and not, but there's nothing wrong with ice cream. And someone who's tempted to eat a bowl of dirt, okay, uh, something is something is deranged or 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 off in that uh, desire, right? In the nature of the desire. Um, so, uh, eating a bowl of dirt is not the same thing as eating a, a second piece of cake, or you know, it, it's so there are heterosexual temptations that are the equivalent of the second and third piece of cake. Right. And there's certain uh, sadomasochistic or pedophile temptations or, you know, things like that, that are more comparable to eating a bowl of dirt. And, and when that when when the Christian who is alert by that recognizes he's alert by that, he confesses the sin. It, well, he what he does is he resists the temptation. He abstains from fleshly lusts. He thanks God for keeping him out of sin. And then if he's wise, he's going to lament the fact that he's still uh, busted up in this way. He's still fallen in this way. He, he acknowledges the corruption of his nature because only a corrupt nature would find something like that attractive. Jared, if you don't have uh, uh, anything, I, I'd love to go off script a little and ask a personal question to both of you, if that's okay, because I'm as you're talking, uh, Pastor Wilson, I am, I'm thinking through the last, well, since I, I went through puberty, really. And, you know, women became more interesting after that point. I, no, no are you serious? <laughs> they did. I, I don't know what happened to me, but yeah. So um, I remember at first thinking like something was wrong with me, like a lot of, you know, young men do. And um I, you know, you kind of enter as a Christian, a state of lust management, I suppose, right? Like, mm -hmm. I, I know not to walk over there. I not, I know to put the security blockers on my computer and all of this. But I've been confessing for years, if, um, and, and hopefully making progress in this area, if my heart skips a beat, right? If there's something that I see on a commercial, let's say I walk into a restaurant and, and something flashes before me. Mm -hmm. I, my gut instinct that I've cultivated over time is to just immediately um, apologize to the Lord. And it, it, it's not like a drawn out thing. It's just, you know, it's quick. It's, and, and it's, and I turn from that, right? I, I don't, I don't want to, I'm not going to look at that. Um, but I know that there's something in me that Jesus didn't have. Because I know he he would not have uh, maybe maybe he could have recognized beauty maybe he could have recognized some of the uh, non uh, erotic attraction kind of things but I um, I've always held the belief at least by default that Jesus wouldn't have felt that so I just apologize Lord I'm I'm far from being perfect and I'm sorry that that still um, can allure me um, as I've been married as I've grown I think it's gotten progressively better in a way I'm, I'm more resistant to that the the inclinations aren't as much um but you know 
if if what you're saying is true, I'm wondering if you would think that that was a um, I don't think you're against what I describe, but if you would advise me if I was in your office in pastoral counseling to confess that it sounds like you're saying that that initial look or that that um, heart jump that wants to go further in a way that Jesus wouldn't wasn't technically a sin. Am I tracking right or am I off? Right. I But I would uh, I would not encourage you pastorally. I would not encourage you to stop doing that. I would encourage okay. you when it's within a second, I would encourage you to change what you say right so i think that when when you're hit wham and you respond rightly um in within a second in a way that you're the most jealous wife could not object to right so you, in other words you behaved you say whoa right. better not be, better not have the seat on that side of the restaurant because that that waitress is dressed in a not good way, right? Sure. And you just immediately say that. I think it's fully appropriate in the um, in the prayer, the instantaneous prayer that you offer up, to say, uh, "Lord, I confess that I'm a fallen creature. Thank you for your grace." I think that. So I think it's um, fully appropriate to address this brokenness, this fallenness, this corruption. I just want to. I just want to reserve confession of sin to sins we actually committed. So there's a point, there's a point where when Peter says abstain from fleshly lusts, there's a point at which I didn't obey him. There's a point at which I'm not abstaining from fleshly lusts, but I don't think that that point is when the starting pistol goes off, when the, when the bell rings. When the, when the temptation starts, I don't think I'm instantaneously defeated because I'm in a battle. Okay. Yeah, I, I can see where you're coming from there. The, um, Pastor Moore, do you agree with that? Or would you say that I should be confessing that? Should be confessing it because it's a motion of original sin. As the Westminster Confession says, as the Heidelberg Catechism says, um, that's why, I mean, that's why you should confess that if you can name it, so we're again original sin fallenness we're, we're not talking about original sin or fallenness we're talking about a particular instance of a motion of original sin that can be named it's not like you don't know what this corruption is it's a very particular thing uh, like what you just described it it has a beginning right i mean it, it started when you saw something so absolutely, it's a particular instance of, of sin in your heart. Now, though you have not failed outwardly, you have failed inwardly because you wanted something disobedient to God. But I would, I would interject there, the instance, the particular instance at the restaurant or wherever it happens, that particular instance, the entire time the sinner involved was saying, no, not going to do it, not going to go there. And I think that there's a dramatic difference between someone saying no the whole time and someone saying let me think about it maybe maybe just this once or any kind any kind i'm with you um jared on any kind of dalliance any kind of okay but as i the illustration i've used is that this is playing tennis with the devil and you don't lose a point when the ball comes on your side of the net you you lose a point when you own it when you now because of our corrupt nature, there are tennis games that we <laughs> shouldn't be in. You know, it, we shouldn't be in the. <laughs> um, that's all true, but I just want to divide up what we confess. We confess our corruption of nature as sinful, and we confess our sins as sinning. So I'm sinning as soon as I say I can do it just this once, or I'm going to taper off, or. I'm, it's not really that bad because, you know, whenever you're rationalizing that way, it's sinning and it's the motions of, it's the motions of original sin with me pushing them along. But if I'm resisting the entire time, if I'm saying, no, 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 let's not do this. Then I don't think that's an in, the, the motions of the, the pot that got stirred in my corrupt nature, that is sinful, right? Yeah. And, and, and that is enough to damn me, apart from the justification of 
imputed righteousness of Christ, that boiling pot is enough to damn me because of what I am. But it's not what I did because I, I'm, I'm saying no. I'm yelling and hollering the whole time. Um, Pastor Wilson, so correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you're saying that original sin is culpable sin, but then it produces something that's not culpable unless your will agrees with it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's, there might be some nuances in there, but that's basically it. So how can, how can original sin produce anything other than sin? Well, because we're complex beings, we're, we're not, it's not just, it's not that any part of me is all of me. All right. So my members, which are on the earth. So Paul t- talks to the Colossians as dearly loved saints, right? To the saints in Colossa and your members, which are on the earth. So I've got members, which are on the earth, which is, a, and then he gives a pretty gnarly list of sins. And those sins are part of me, but they are not me. And this is this is one of the reasons why I want to tell homosexual, uh, let's put it as a homosexually tempted um, uh, believers, not to identify themselves by their temptations or by their sins. And uh, let me, uh, someone just wrote uh, me in my letter section this morning that I thought it'd be good to in, in, insert Please. here. The... Um, the Bloomington Q&A back and forth was in 2012. It was a decade ago. It was before all the revoice stuff. Right. It was before the side B stuff. It was before the big rhetorical push came in the church that said, you can be, um, you can be, have your flame on and be a gay Christian and bring those gay treasures into the new Jerusalem. My answer to uh, the lady in the Q and A was speaking in an old era. I was simply talking about the people in our church who, when they're going to be, who, when they're tempted, are going to be tempted in this direction, at least for the time being. I wasn't going in for any kind of orientation, such that if that Q and A happened today, post revoice, I would say that I would hold. I'm holding the same doctrine that I held back then, but I think I would certainly phrase it differently i would uh, phrase it differently I'd, because now after in post the push to make our identity all wrapped up in our sin what i said in 2012 i think is really going to be susceptible to misunderstanding in 2023 so uh, i am saying that the part of me can make a suggestion to me and that's not all of me I'm my will, my choices, the new man, uh, all of that is, uh, I'm a, I'm a unit responsible before God as an individual and the decision-making process when I pursue righteousness or when I get into sin, that decision-making process is, um, complicated. So the flesh in Galatians five, the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. The fact of that battle does not mean that I'm sinning all the time. That's what I'm, that's what I'm resisting. What I'm, what I'm wanting to say is that it's possible for us to walk with God despite the corruption of our nature. Yeah, you know, oh, go ahead, Jared. Did you say have something? I didn't. Go ahead, brother. Okay. So I was thinking of an analogy. And by the way, I just want to say I was going to bring up um, whether or not you would, if you had a redo on those uh, uh, Q and A's, whether you'd say something different. So I appreciate you addressing that, and that's I'm glad you said that because um, I, I definitely, when I first heard it, I know what that communicated to me, or at least what, what I thought I was hearing was that in a room of people who believe in sexual orientation ingrained, right, like we don't agree with, should be part of your identity. Like they're going to hear that and think, oh, I can have people who identify as that, who don't need to confess that um, they just don't act on it. And so, um, yeah, yeah we, so, don't, we wouldn't let uh, we would if we had someone whose temptations when they occur are homosexual. If I'm pastoring 
people in that situation, and I have and do. Um, and they started identifying themselves as a gay Christian. Um, we would say none of that. No, you're just a Christian. You're you're a member here. You you don't get to identify with that sin. In fact, there's there was, there was uh, at one time some time ago uh, someone who in that situation who came from another church background, and he had sort of been uh, a spokesman against uh, the gay agenda, the gay jihad where he was because he had this idea he had the he had the moral authority to speak to it because these are my temptations and and that was one of the first things i talked to him about dropping you can't do that. you can't do that here you don't have you don't have the identity as a homosexual but as his pastor i know that he's not likely to be tempted in certain ways and is likely to be tempted in other ways the next go round okay yeah, no, that, I, I understand for the ca pastoral counseling side of this, which I know, uh, Pastor Moore, we weren't really talking about. I mean, that's I, I had a lot of people reacting uh, because they everyone's in a unique, different spot on this when they experience these desires. And um, they it, it's just interesting because some some of them want to to hear what you're saying about, you know, resist. And it seems discouraging, which is a question I was going to ask you, Pastor Moore out of the gate to feel like they're um they're failing already but I, I wanted to just say if i can i'm going off the script again i'm sorry guys here's one analogy though i just came to my head and i'm wondering i don't know if this will build a bridge or not but maybe be interesting to talk about this so if i had a car that let's just say because i do actually it's shocks need to be replaced i go over bumps and i feel it right um and i know there's a road that's a dirt road and I'm going to feel it a lot. And so I know there's this capacity to damage my car. I'm not going to go on that road. I'm going right. to, so I avoid the billboard when I'm, you know, a different route to work, whatever it may be. But as soon as I feel a bump on the shocks, I know I'm doing damage. And, um, and that's a failure. That's, you know, the result of, you know, whatever we'll, we'll say a sin nature equivalent here, but there's, there's a, there's a flaw in my car. And Jesus wouldn't have had a car like that. His car would have had, you know, the best shocks. It would have been a perfect car. And um, and so it's not like I, I guess I wouldn't be apologizing for for the car I have, the, that that nature all the time. Like like you gave in your um, blog example, Pastor Wilson, like 24 seven apologizing for your sin nature. But the moment I do go on a bump, though. And, and right. And, and the shocks are, are tested and they're failing. And this is, you know, even if I turn away from that bump, that's that's where I've always thought that's where the sin is. Um, so so the difference I'm I guess I'm drawing is uh, recognizing the capacity for temptation that we have versus actually being internally tempted like James talks about. So, right. yeah, and, I don't uh, know. what you're describing here is some I think it's Thomas Watson says some Christians tempt the devil to tempt them <laughs> right yes a, a lot of christians do that unfortunately right. and and driving on the wrong road not not taking precautions things like that uh, that would be a separate temptation it's not it's not the temptation of sinning that way it's the temptation of tempting the devil to tempt them that way to to doubt right. it. and i've all, done that yes <laughs> right and i think we all i think we all have and we ought to be all over it and be uh, resisting anything that is going to, um, I think John Owen said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Uh, and that is very true. So it's, you can't play with baby vipers and say, well, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to be in a debate with Jared over when the baby viper becomes dangerous. You know, when, when I'm nursing this little baby viper, uh, no, it's a viper be done with, you know, no. You know, when you see the nature of it, you say no right away. I just want to say that it's possible for a Christian to say no to something immediately. As soon as it, as soon as it hits him, he can say no and have the reflex action be no and have it be something that some part of his being would find attractive if he said yes. Yeah, I got you. Uh, Jared, since we have limited time left, uh, um, I mean, what do you what, what's your reaction to this? I, I I particularly, if you want to go down this path, be interested in whether or not the position that Pastor Wilson's advocating, if you think that that dovetails with 
uh, the reform tradition and, and and with what the Bible teaches um, with, with, you know, specific passages and stuff. I don't know if you have that at the tip of uh, your tongue, but because because I, I'd like to see the scripture back and forth. We've talked about what Peter said and a little bit about James. Paul, Paul says in Romans 7 that he lusts with his flesh. Um, it is his flesh that is lusting. It's sinning. Um, even when he's not consenting with his mind. I mean, that, that's how Paul describes it in Romans 7. Um, you know, the Westminster Confession says that, um, you know, this, uh, this corruption of nature during this life doth remain in those that are regenerated, and although it be through Christ pardoned and mortified, yet both itself and all the motions thereof are truly and properly sin. Pastor Wilson is saying that somewhere between original sin and motions, he has come up with something else that is not sin. No, it's sin. it's truly and properly sin. But there's I'm making a distinction between what is sinful by its nature. Original sin and all its motions are truly and properly sin. And and I could be damned on the basis of it plus nothing. But you're saying I, only only to confess the corruption, not the motions. No, I think you should confess the corruption and the motions as sinful. I think that you should only co confess the sinning as sinning. That's the distinction I'm making. That there are actions that I take, decisions that I make, that are discrete sins that I must confess as a sin that I committed. And I committed that sin because, it, because I gave way to my corrupt nature that is truly, properly, and sinful. But I'm making a distinction between what I am in this part of me, in my nature, and what I do. That's, that's the distinction I'm, I'm making. The, the, one, uh, the one thing I, I did want to have a chance to ask you, Jared, is, and this is a very practical question, pastoral question. What do pastors do with people in this position? All right, let's, let's say I've got someone who comes to join my church. He is committed. He's not a, a side B guy. He's not a revoice guy, but his temptations are homosexual. When he's tempted, it's homosexual temptation. And let's say uh, that I believe that there's hope for him where he can eventually repudiate that and get married. And, you know, I, I don't believe once homosexual, always homosexual, you know, but let's say uh, during the next three years that he's going to be in grad school here in my church. What do I do with him? What do I excommunicate if, if he sins homosexually, if he gives way to this and confesses it, do I excommunicate him for having uh, this orientation? For having this orientation? Yes, it's truly, um, improperly, it's truly improperly sin. He's sinning all the time. We're all sinning all the time. Well, then why don't we excommunicate everybody? Well, if we could see our hearts, we would excommunicate everybody. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's for real. That's the issue. Like, if we could see what God sees, but we are supposed to excommunicate based on what we see, not based on what's going on in people's hearts. But what if you, I've, I'm seeing this, I'm counseling him weekly. And after 10 weeks of this, where every, every week he's saying, yeah, I, I struggled again this week. At what point do I bring charges? Anyone who's repentant, it's not the time, the amount of time between each desire um, that, that equals true repentance. Because then you would, you would end up being sinless in this world well, right i but mean true but true repentance if i'm dealing with a guy who's um living with his girlfriend or keeps going over every weekend he goes over and to see his girlfriend sleeps with her after he it doesn't matter how repentant he talks you're, he, you're talking about them. outward actions again i mean if this guy's having homosexual relations outwardly um again but that's what you but hasn't, hasn't your approach flattened all that? That's my, my point. If he acknowledges to me, yeah, I, I didn't act on it. I don't have a boyfriend. I didn't go cruising the bars. But yeah, I gave, I gave way to lustful thoughts for 
a half an hour on Tuesday and then again for an hour and a half on Thursday. And now I'm back in your office on Monday. How do you pastor someone like that? You encourage them to continue the fight because you as a pastor are having the same battle with other sins. Um, I mean, if you're not, then you have to teach Christian perfectionism. Right. And, 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 so, and thank you. Thank you. Because that's something I also wanted to mention. Uh, because in your original uh, take, in your in your appearance on, on John's show here, um, one of the things you talked about was a deficient hamart hamartiology. And uh, I, can't, I grew up in a uh, perfectionistic, uh, I won't say a theological tradition, but I, I, my father, who I respect very, very highly, was a very, very godly man. But he had, he had a perfectionist streak in him in terms of, Bible says to be perfect and you can be perfect. And here's the verse and what's your problem, <laughs> right? So I, I grew up uh, with that. And when I became reformed, uh, that was one of the it, limited atonement was a big thing for me, but the reformed doctrine of sin was also a big hurdle for me to, And so uh, I wanted to sort of go on the record and say, I know and understand the reformed doctrine of sin and corruption, and I embrace it, I embrace it fully. So I'm not being perfectionistic here. What I'm saying is that I want certain confessions to go in box A, and I want other confessions to go in box B. And I think that it is pastorally helpful to people to be able to say, this is under the blood, this is, this is dealt with by the imputed righteousness of Christ, the corruption of your nature. You are responsible for what you do. All right? You're responsible for what you do. So everything boils down to, do I categorize this as a manifestation of some what I am in some part of me? And what do I categorize as actions for which I take individual responsibility? Because, yeah, I did that. Okay, so in Romans 7, Paul takes individual responsibility for his flesh lusting. And you're saying that you shouldn't do that. I mean, so Peter, when he says not to, you know, don't give into the fleshly lusts, they're still called fleshly lusts. Like, yeah, I, 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 when I, I take here, here's the thing. Uh, I first, I, I don't want to get, go down a wormhole here, but uh, what I've got a different take on Romans seven, but everything that uh, reformed. Uh, theologians say is happening in Romans 7, I affirm is, hap is happening in Galatians 5. So in Galatians 5, the battle between the, the flesh and the spirit, what you're claiming out of Romans 7, I think is actually happening in Galatians 5. So it's not, it's a, it's a difference over uh, where does the Bible teach this, not does the Bible teach this. But I, I make a distinction between when I take responsibility I can take responsibility for two things. I can take responsibility for what I am. I can also take responsibility for what I do. I'm just saying that those are two different things. I am responsible for, um, for being a sinner. I, I'm, so it, Adam sinned and Adam sinned representatively. He represented us well. And that's why I'm entailed in original sin. That's why I'm, I have this corrupt nature and I am responsible and I can take responsibility for that. But what I'm taking responsibility for is what I am. And then in another venue, in another area, I also take responsibility for the things that I do or think or say or play with. So I don't know if you have anything, oh, go ahead. I, under, I understand the distinctions you're making, but I, I don't think that that is the reformed position. I think it deals with what we're talking about is you're saying that your fallenness produces things that you're not culpable for until you submit to them. I'm not culpable for them as a sin. I am culpable for them as, as my nature. But, but you're saying you don't have to confess them whenever they come from your heart. You're saying you don't have to confess. Like when a particular fleshly lust springs up, you're saying you don't have to confess it. You're saying you have to confess your fallenness 
But when that fallenness actually moves, you don't have to confess the motion. Now, when the when that fallenness moves and runs into the brick wall of my no, right? If so, uh, moves where? That's the that's the point. So when my, when there's a when there's a stir in my fleshly corrupt nature, if it runs into a no from me immediately, that's when I say you've got nothing to confess. If it moves and is moving around the room freely. <laughs> you know if if i'm ter- if it's stirring the pot and i'm just going i'm just not paying attention then yeah i should confess that as a sin motions un motions of sin unrebuked motions of sin not resisted should absolutely be confessed but that motion came from your heart yeah like it, it's disobedient to god it is a motion towards sin before your mind submits to it before your will submits to it it is still an action from you even though you rebuke it because my rebuke also comes from my heart right but it is still like that that should not even be there it wasn't in jesus it's not in jesus it will not be in us in eternity it wasn't in sinless adam right that's why i need i need the justification of christ all right, it's I, I, it is one oh four, and I know I, I told you guys that I wanted to end at one. Um, if that's possible. Is it all right? Could you give me five more minutes? Cause I just wanna there there's I wanna say one thing if that's okay. Um five more minutes re- fine with me. Okay, all right. Okay. So I was reading John Calvin's commentary on this. I know I haven't read as much as probably either of you on this issue, but I was reading his commentary on James, and um it was interesting to me. He talks about uh I'll just I'll just jump to the one section. I'd love to read the whole thing to you, but we don't have time for that. He says the papists, and this is on verse 15 is what he's commenting on. The papists ignorantly lay hold on this passage and seek to prove from it that vicious, yea, filthy, wicked, and the most abominable lusts are not sins, provided there is no assent. And so there's a contrast in his commentary. And um, I know people have been sending me um, uh, who have also been looking into this since Jared brought it up quotes from other reformed theologians. And, and it seems to be that Luther also shared a similar view. And um, so did John Owen. And so um, th- this is my second to last question that I wanted to bring up, but is, do you have a, um, a pastor Wilson, like a, a disagreement in your mind with any elements of like, like, would you be at odds with Calvin on this question you think? And more because you're saying sounds a little bit more like the, the papist he's describing, or is that, a, am I misreading it? I, th- I think that I would collide with the papists when, by saying these vicious motions and stuff are, I would say they are sinful and they are truly and properly sin. They, so I'm, I think that they are, um, uh, they would be urging um, as acting as though all of these temptations are coming from outside the walls, right? It's like some stranger walked up to you on the street and said, hey, let's go get drunk. And you said, no, um, that's that's not what I'm talking about. When I abstain from fleshly lusts, it's my fleshly lust that I'm abstaining from. So I'm saying there has to be a sense in which it's mine. It also has to be a, the, a sense in which I it's possible for me to abstain. So okay, see, I, think I, yeah. I think I would be closer to the reformed on this and i and i don't think i would disagree in principle i think i'm simply making an additional distinction that i think fits with their basic paradigm so so you do make that distinction between the inner and outer lusts that that john calvin does yeah oh you do okay um the the other thing is since i know i only asked for five minutes and we have two left um you did mention earlier pastor wilson uh someone in your church who might have that orientation and um, and I, and I know what you meant. I think you, they, they experience temptations yeah. in this area. Right. Have you considered maybe using or trying to implement a, a Rosera Butterfield, by the way, corrected me on this, or she approached me in a similar fashion and said, John, have you thought of using different language here and just saying people who experience these attractions or sin, sinful desires yeah. because of the way yes. orientation is taken? Yes, that's one of the things that I, I was referring to when I said the the Bloomington thing was pre-revoiced. Right, right. So or, orientation is now 
um, been, uh, used to be a useful word. I don't think it's useful anymore. Okay. So it's just part of that, the, the habits we've cultivated and using the term that it comes up sometimes, but right. I just wanted to make sure everyone understood clearly what you were saying. Um, all right. Yeah, well, I, I agree. We, okay. So, uh, we, we only have like 30 seconds. So I just want to say thank you to both of you for participating in this. And, um, you know, even thank though I, I sense an impasse between pastor, uh, more and pastor Wilson, I do think this is helpful for us to think biblically on and, and we're being challenged. We're really going back and forth and, and that's what we're supposed to do as Bereans. And so, um, you both being busy pastors have given me your time, which is so precious, I know. And so once again, um, thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks for having us. And Jared, thank you for the cordial interaction. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Wilson. And John, thank you for having us, man. I appreciate your time. Yeah, my pleasure. God bless.